Today we continue a series from 1 John called, How Will They Know We Are Christians? And I have given today's sermon the creative title, Part Three. <laughs> if you weren't here for parts one and two, you may need to know that 1 John is a little book way, way over in the back of your Bible. So far back, you may have to use the table of contents to find it. But it is worth the search a book well worth reading. In the first sermon, I told you that it was written in the context of a church split, that some people had already left the congregation, and these words were probably written to those who remained. In fact, some scholars think that 1 John is not so much a letter written to the church as it is a sermon delivered in the church to those few people who were still there. Maybe the person who delivered it was the bishop or the overseer of the churches in that area. Now, if this had happened in our time and in our tradition, it wouldn't be the bishop who preached this sermon because we Baptists don't have bishops. But it might be the director of missions of the local association who would have heard about the church and its trouble long before he was ever contacted. But one Monday morning, as soon as he got into the office, the phone would ring and the chairman of the deacons from that little church would call and say, Reverend, we've got trouble right here in Philadelphia Baptist Church. He might say, you know, after our last pastor left, we got into this big doctrinal dispute and things got bad and then they got worse and it turned into an ugly church fight that led to an even uglier church split. And now here we are, just a handful of us left and most of us pretty badly beaten up. Do you think you could come next Sunday and, and preach to us? We could really use a word of encouragement. And the director of missions would say, of course, and he would write it down on his calendar and begin to work right then and there on a sermon that would be appropriate for that situation. The following Sunday, he would stand in the pulpit and look out over a sanctuary that was mostly empty. Some people still sitting out there nursing black eyes with their arms in slings and bandages on their heads. And he would cluck his tongue and say, my little children. Mm, mm, mm. And then he would start to preach. He would want to take them back to the foundations of their faith so that they could rebuild on something solid. He would remind them of what they had been taught from the very beginning. And then this church, apparently, they have been taught to believe in the name of God's Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he had commanded them. That's right there in 1 John 3, 23. To believe in the name of God's Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he had commanded them. The trouble began with that first thing. There were some in the church who had been seduced by some early form of Gnosticism, who had come to believe that the flesh was essentially evil, while the spirit was essentially good. If that were true, they reasoned, then the Son of God could not have come in the flesh. He must have only appeared that way. They began to say that the divine Christ, who was spirit, had put on the flesh of Jesus Christ like a man might put on an overcoat in order to walk around among us to teach and preach and heal. But when that overcoat was nailed to the cross, it wasn't Christ who died, but Jesus. And on Easter morning, it wasn't Jesus who rose from the dead, but Christ. It almost makes sense, doesn't it? And as I've told you before, that's the problem with heresy. It is never 180 degrees away from the truth, but only a few degrees in either direction. So much like the real thing, you can hardly tell the difference. But there is a difference. And the preacher of 1 John knew it. He knew that those people who had left couldn't say Jesus and Christ in the same sentence, couldn't call him by that name. They didn't believe those two were one and the same. Now that's something we have come to call the docetic heresy. 
the idea that Christ only appeared to be human. It comes from the Greek word dokeo, which means to seem or to appear. But in the beginning, it wasn't really a heresy. It was just a difference of opinion there in that little church. Some people were on one side of the issue and some were on the other. It happens all the time in churches. Whether it's a discussion about what color the carpet in the sanctuary should be, or a decision about who can be a member of the congregation. And you know how it goes. We have a hard time leaving things in the realm of opinion. Soon it's not just their ideas, but those people who are the problem. We begin to raise our voices and point our fingers and call them names. And when we do, we abandon that second foundational teaching, which is to love one another as Christ has commanded us. At the beginning of today's reading from 1 John, the preacher says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought also to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Let's pause right there for a moment. If love means laying down your life for someone, how many people do you truly love? Count them on your fingers right now. Is it one, three, five? Maybe more than that, but not much more than that. Probably not more than a double handful. And so like the lawyer in Luke's gospel who asked, who is my neighbor? We want to ask the preacher of First John, who is my brother and sister? For whom do I have to lay down my life? Which may explain why that question about who can be a member is such a hard one for churches. If this is someone we may have to lay our lives down for someday, then we want to make that decision very carefully. It's a little bit like adoption. You don't just say to your spouse one day, hey, I know, let's adopt a baby, and the next day bring one home. You have to talk about these things for a while, maybe for months. You have to ask yourself the question, can we afford to do this? Do we have enough room in our home and in our hearts? Can we make a lifelong commitment to someone we have never met? Our new membership process here at First Baptist is better than the old one. These days we ask people to attend all four sessions of our Connections class for newcomers. We ask them to have a conversation with the pastor so they can talk about their spiritual journey. Then and only then are we ready to vote on their membership. It's better than it used to be when we sometimes voted on people as soon as they walked down the aisle before we ever got to know them. But it would still be hard to say that we really know all our new members. If I called you this afternoon and said, hey, do you remember John who joined us a few weeks ago, right? Remember him? Well, turns out he needs a kidney transplant, and I was wondering if you could give him one of yours. <laughs> and then I would wait for your response. Probably I would wait for a long time. Why should I give John one of my kidneys? I don't know that guy. And yet the preacher of 1 John doesn't seem to think that's too much to ask. He says, Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. He says it because there were some in the church, apparently, who were in need. And there were others in the church who refused to help. This preacher is shocked by that kind of behavior. He says, honestly, Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Are you telling me that you can't lay down a $5 bill for your brother or sister? How can you say that the love of God abides in you? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Let's stop saying, hey, I'm praying for you, and start saying, hey, I'm paying for your groceries. Now that's action. It speaks louder than words. He was probably talking about those people who had left the church. They were probably the ones who didn't love their brothers and sisters enough to pay their bills. But he was talking to those people in the pews, just like I'm 
talking to you. He was setting a standard for behavior in the Christian community. He was saying that if you have the world's goods and there is somebody in the church who doesn't and who has a need, you should share. Again, it explains why this question about who can be a member is such a hard one for us. If we begin to welcome more and more members who don't have the world's goods, then those who have the world's goods are going to get more and more nervous. That's why I was interested in this article by Stan Wilson, pastor of Northside Baptist Church in Clinton, Mississippi. He says, our church has an unwritten rule. We will never ignore a member's basic need. Whenever our members know of a need in the church, they call me. Is there any money in the benevolence fund? You know, Johnny got cut back on his hours and his kids need help with school supplies. The answer is always yes. We've yet to encounter a need we couldn't fill. He says, another church I pastored once hosted a church-wide garage sale to meet a medical need. So even though it is an unwritten rule, I believe it to be ironclad. We will not let another member go without food or medical treatment. If a young person needs help going to school, we'll find a way. If someone's house is unlivable, we'll find them a new one or invite them into a spare room. I would say that's true for us as well here at First Baptist. From time to time, someone will let me know that they need some help buying groceries or paying a bill, and I'll make a few phone calls, and within a few minutes, that need will have been met. We seem to believe that no member of this church should have to go hungry or shiver in the cold. But we haven't ever written that down, have we? Stan Wilson says, one Wednesday night, I asked those in our Bible study why we have never thought to make explicit what we know to be true. Why not say it out loud? It seems like great news to me in an anxious age when we live in fear of economic collapse or terrorist attack and are just waiting for the housing bubble to pop or for oil production to peak. Why not make it official? Why not state out loud that no matter how bad it gets, we will be there for one another? Now, Stan Wilson said those words back in 2006. And you might understand why his church chose not to make it official right there before the economic collapse, before the housing bubble burst. They didn't make it official for the same reason we don't make it official. Because we believe that if we ever said that, if we ever said out loud that no member of this church will ever have to go hungry or shiver in the cold, the line of people waiting to join First Baptist would stretch from Richmond to Roanoke. Everybody would want to join. But listen to what Stan Wilson says. He says, I know of a church that has made such a statement. The Church of the Servant King in Eugene, Oregon has a rule that no one in its membership will be in need. The members claim that this rule has freed them in surprising ways. They work fewer hours so they can spend more time with one another. They are able to afford to work less because they know they can count on each other. Their common life looks like, well, it looks like fun, he says. The rest of us are busy working two jobs to a family. Our kids skip recess because they have to study for national tests. I wonder if a simple pledge never to let one another starve would loosen us up. If we knew that it's not finally up to us to secure our future, wouldn't that free us so we could begin to spend a little more unhurried time together and with our families? Like so many other things in the Bible, turning the other cheek, loving our enemies, praying for those who persecute us, this may be a question that never gets answered simply because we never get up the courage to try. Maybe it's because we are afraid that someone will take advantage of us. And because of that, we never experience true community. Fear holds us back. But go back to that adoption thing for just a minute. According to the preacher of 1 John, we are 
God's children. And it's not that we were born that way, it's that God has lavished His love upon us, has made us members of His own family. Paul talks about this in Romans. He says, you didn't receive a spirit of fear, you received a spirit of adoption. And so now you are the children of God, inheritors along with Christ of every good thing God has to give. So this morning, take a look to your left and right. Look around you at the people who are here. Sitting there on the church pew beside you is a child of God just like you. You are members of the same family. And it's not because somebody voted on your membership, it's because God has called you His own dear children. Now, I don't know how it is in your family, but in my family, we take care of each other. It's a rule for us. Christy is the one who brought us the language. She said long time ago, family takes care of family. But ever since then, that's the way it's been in our house. There was a time when it was simpler than it is now, when my parents were stronger and my children were younger. If Ellie and Catherine had a need, we could meet them easily. But life goes on and circumstances change. This Saturday, some of you know, my oldest daughter, Ellie, is getting married. It's true. Back in October, she and a talented young chef from Australia named Nick McNevin went to City Hall in New York and took care of the paperwork. But this Saturday, in a small private ceremony in an undisclosed location, <laughs> we're going to celebrate with holy words and fancy dresses and delicious wedding cake and joyful music we are going to have a great party. And at the end of it all, our family will be larger by one Australian. So you wonder, how do I feel about that? Yeah, I feel great. <laughs> I do because Ellie met Nick while they were in high school in Washington, D.C., where he was a foreign exchange student. They, they corresponded for a year before he moved to New York, and before I met him, they were already deeply in love. So instead of sticking out my hand and introducing myself, the first time I laid eyes on that boy, I grabbed him and pulled him in for a bone-crushing bear hug. I thought, listen, if my daughter loves you, then I love you too. And if she wants to bring you into this family, I am not going to stand in the way. I'm going to throw open the door and drag you into the house. <laughs> I've gotten to know him a little better since then. I found out that he is charming and thoughtful and funny, and he takes good care of my daughter, which is important to a dad. Not only that, but he has cooked some wonderful gourmet meals <laughs> for me that make me like him and not only love him. He has become a part of our family, Nick McNevin. There is no going back. And that's a good thing. You see, I believe that if I can learn to love Nick like a son, maybe he can learn to love me like a father. And one of these days, when I'm old and feeble, he may be the one sitting beside my hospital bed, spooning foie gras into my mouth <laughs> and washing it down with champagne. He he may already know it, but if he doesn't, I hope he will learn it from us, the members of my family, that this is the rule. Family takes care of family. I think that's what God wants for the members of His family. He wants us to take care of each other. And Jesus, His only Son, has set the example. The writer of 1 John said, Jesus Christ laid down His life for us. We ought also to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. He didn't say it like this, but I think this is what the preacher of 1 John meant. That if we do this, 
if we take care of one another. This is how they will know that we are Christians. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, we thank you for that example you have set before us, an example of selfless love. We pray that we might find the courage to lay down our lives for one another and to do it not out of any sense of duty, but to do it as you did, out of a sense of great love. As we look around on the faces of the people in this room, may we see the faces of our brothers and sisters in Christ. For we ask it in your name. Amen.